Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome back to another open source on-ramp talk. Uh, so these series of talks are aimed at people who are new to the industry, trying to find out what's going on, where stuff fits. Uh, in this case, the talk is about open source and uh, what that should really mean to you, and as it says, competitive advantage. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn you over to Brendan. Great, thanks, Tim. I also will not be singing, um, which is to you, for your benefit. Um, and if you saw my colleague's keynote earlier, I also don't have music and lighting, but that's okay. Um, right, so thanks so much for coming. Uh, I was actually talking to another colleague uh, just a few minutes ago, and I realized uh, this is the first in-person talk I've given since February of 2020, uh, which was my first talk in my current role <laughs> and the last one that I did in person. So it's really great to be back in person uh, and see all of you here. So thanks for coming. And, and like Tim said, I want to talk a little bit about um, the competitive advantage that open source can give people, right? I think that's an important thing. Uh, you know, Tim was talking about how we want to you know, learn, and for folks that are new to the industry or maybe new to open source, um, you know, what that really means. Uh, and I want to kind of put it in context. And I think, I think the context um, that I like to think about, you, you hear a lot of folks talk about a software as a software factory, right? Uh, you, especially, especially in government, you know, they like things that are industrial and factory-based. But I think it's a decent metaphor. Uh, and when we're thinking about this factory metaphor, I think a lot of times where we go in our head is traditional like factory things, right? The tools that we have in the factory, uh, the folks that are working in the factory to put parts together and okay, the parts are, are definitely part of it too. Uh, it's the process uh, that something goes through from being you know, raw materials to something that's a value added good that we can go and sell to customers, right? That's the kind of typical um, factory mentality. And you know, something else we might think of, especially in the U.S., if you, if you grew up in the U.S., uh, definitely learned about is like Henry Ford and the assembly line, right? So you hear folks talk about how, you know, towards the end of the Industrial Revolution, when Ford um, didn't invent the automobile and didn't invent the assembly line, uh, but perfected the assembly line to, you know, have it be this thing where uh, he could very efficiently produce uh, the same car all the time uh, at the same quality, and, and do it in a way where he had folks specializing in what they were doing, right? Again, a lot of the Industrial Revolution up until that point was also about you know, people having specialized skills and being able to focus on a specialty. Uh, and that was kind of the revolutionary part of you know, how Ford really looked at this assembly line process, you know, have someone specialize and things come to them and they do their specialized task and then it moves on. Uh, and that was really effective, right? Again, you could get um, high production at a low cost uh, out of that, you get you know, the Model T and the Model A car. Um, it only came in black, right? He said, Ford famously said that you can have my car in any color you want as long as it's black. Uh, but it was super efficient. Uh, but then later, right, if we, go, if we fast forward a little bit, uh, when other car makers entered the car market, especially when Toyota uh, came from Japan and entered the American car market, it was a lot different, right? Uh, Toyota looked a lot different than Ford. And in fact, you know, I said, if you grow up in the US today, you might learn about the assembly line of Ford. That's probably the elementary level, right? If you go to business school, you probably learn about the Toyota production system, right? You hear people talk about that all the time. And just in time inventory and a lot of other revolutionary things that Toyota did. And so what did Toyota do that was so vastly different than what Ford was able to do that led them to become the number one car manufacturer in the world when Ford and, and the other American car makers had such, such kind of a head start? Well, they didn't just think about those tools inside the factory and those people that are specializing in things inside the factory, right? That was the revolution we talked about Ford bringing us. But they also thought about all of the things that came before that, right? The raw materials weren't just raw materials to them. There was a whole supply chain uh, ahead of them <clears throat> before the raw materials got to the factory that Toyota became masters of, right? And we've seen throughout history, uh, supply chains really be a critical part of, of mastering the thing that you're trying to do, whether it's a war or, or building a car. And, and so that's how Toyota really was able to make another step change in how people looked at manufacturing by 
by not only looking at what was inside of their own factory, uh, like Ford did, but also looking at how can they uh, influence and work on the efficiency and the effectiveness of their suppliers that are bringing them raw materials, right? And so famously, uh, not only do they have these fantastic relationships where they're able to kind of mold their suppliers to what Toyota needs, they also, if you talk to their suppliers, all right, if someone's an auto parts supplier, uh, they love working with Toyota more than any other company uh, because of this, this focus on suppliers isn't just, uh, it's not just about them, right? It's about the common good that their suppliers and them can come, can come together and realize by working closer than just kind of a consumer supplier relationship. And so that's, that's how Toyota really wins. And so that's the context I kind of want to set for today. Again, as, as Tim mentioned, my name is Brendan O'Leary, and I was actually just running a, a colleague of mine through my history. I've been at GitLab since 2017, uh, and I've had a couple different roles there. I spent time in our uh, starting a uh, professional services organization when we didn't have one because we were a small, tiny little company. Uh, I spent time running product uh, for our Verify stage, which is you know, CIC, well, CI, and uh, our GitLab runner and a lot of things like that. And then as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I, in January of 2020, uh, finally Priyanka Sharma, who's actually now the general manager of the CNCF, she was working at GitLab at the time and she had been trying to convince me to come be an evangelist. And I, I had kind of been doing that part time um, ever since I had been at GitLab. But the thing is when you're 150 people, like everyone's a part time everything. <laughs> but when you're 1500 people, no one can be a part time anything. Uh, so I had to kind of make a decision, and I was worried about too much travel because I've got four small kids at home. Some travel is great, but too much travel. <laughs> yeah. Some travel is just right, uh, but too much travel is, is too hard on the family. Uh, and she said, oh, no, we, you know, we're GitLab. We're all remote. Uh, we're going to do remote evangelism well. And this was in, like, December 2019. Uh, and so then I start in February 2020, uh, and I gave my last in-person talk um, the venue was okay, I guess. It was in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, hey, now I'm doing this thing. I'm going to go in conferences and speak. And then uh, little did I know that uh, Priyanka was a little bit more uh, aware of where we were going <laughs> than anybody really at the time. Even, you know, she didn't know what she was predicting. Um, so anyway, really happy to get to talk to you. And so I want to kind of dig into, you know, how this context really applies in open source. And I think um, the next three words are one that you've seen probably too many times this week, um, but we have to bring them up, okay? It's software supply chain, right? And I'm not going to talk to you about software supply chain security, I promise. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of fantastic folks that know more about that. I, I even have a talk about it, but this isn't that talk, so we're not, <laughs> we're not going to talk about uh, software supply chain security. But I do want to talk about it uh, in context. Uh, because, again, the context of this, the situation we're in, you know, software supply chain security being such a critical thing, which it is, right? We heard about that in all, probably every keynote, right? Uh, even, like, at the first day, I can't remember which two it was, but someone said, oh, the person before me gave 15 minutes of my talk because it was about supply chain security, <laughs> right? And they skipped over that part. Um, but I, as much as that's important, and I don't want to take away from that, I think if you take a step back, it's, it's more of a symptom uh, than, than an original problem. Uh, and I think it's a symptom of, of a few things. Um, and so I hope to convince you in this talk that it's a symptom and that there's more to be done than just thinking about supply chain security. Uh, and I also hope to convince you, like I said, of the business value or the competitive advantage that can come from contributing to open source. Now, I'm well aware that in this audience, I'm probably like, this is a choir, and I'm now preaching to it, right? Uh, so I'm also going to spend some time, uh, again, laying this found work for the foundation of the situation we're in uh, so that you can go back to your leadership and lay the same found foundation, hopefully, right, for them and have some actual things at the end that individual contributors to do, can do to uh, influence uh, within their own organizations and also that leaders can do uh, if they are in a leadership position to help influence this. So I'm aware some of it's preaching to the crowd, but I think hopefully you'll get something out of you know, this foundation that we can lay about this, again, bigger picture than even just 
software supply chain security. And I think that the reason we're in that situation and the reason that is such a critical thing is what we've talked about, again, a lot to this week, about how critical open source software has become in the world. Right, so famously, well, semi-famously, Mark Andreessen, I think it was about 12 or 14 years ago now, said that software was eating the world, right? This is in the early days of like SaaS really becoming a, a huge deal uh, in business, and that being the way that now we're gonna deliver software and consume software, right? Salesforce being the like preeminent example of that. Um, but I think the situation we're in now is software has eaten the world, like 14 years later. He, I, I think, you know, I think Andre, Mark Andreessen was right, and he's right a lot, so okay. Um, but I think now open source software is eating the world. Uh, I think the same kind of transition that we saw from proprietary boxed or delivered as, you know, in a, on a CD software transition to a SaaS delivery model of software, we're seeing another step change uh, in the way that the world produces and consumes software, uh, and, that's, and that's, that's open source. And because of that situation, you know, or organizations re are required to have open source in order to compete, right? A lot of us are here representing large organizations or small organizations that have sent us here because they understand at least there is some value here, right? There's some part of, <coughs> excuse me, open source that's required for us to stay competitive uh, in the current environment. And, and I think because of that, right, Mark Andreessen was making that prediction or, or that statement about software years ago uh, as part of the overall thesis of software is a thing you need to focus on, right? And, and I think, again, that's now a foregone conclusion. If it wasn't already before the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, we've seen companies increase investment in digital transformation and increase investment in software, uh, even when, you know, the economy is kind of a little bit <laughs> unpredictable because it's an unpredictable world. And, and that's because those who best leverage software are going to win. And I think in a world where open source is eating the world, those who are able to best leverage open source software are gonna be the ones who win in their respective industry regardless of what it is. But that doesn't come without complication, right? So it's, it's complicated to begin with, but I think there's three places to look at, you know, what makes that hard? Why is that not something that just naturally happens? Again, many of us maybe think, Brendan, I'm with you, it makes sense, <laughs> but we're not doing it. Why are we not, why are we not seeing, um, you know, why is that not an easy thing to convince uh, my CFO of or, or, or somebody in leadership, business leadership of? Well, I think there's three sets of complications I wanna talk about here. First, for organizations, then for the projects themselves, and then for individual contributors to those projects. And so for, for organizations, you know, they have to be open to open source. Again, I think a lot have just gotten over the paradigm of, oh, we're gonna run our software in the cloud. We're not gonna have everything be on premise. Right, they just kind of <laughs> got adapted to that maybe, right? We're gonna not necessarily own every piece of software. We might have some that's SaaS. Um, and then open source is another, again, step change for them to say, you know, how open to open source are we? And again, even in organizations who acknowledge this as something that needs to happen, it's not always easy. Like I, I was speaking, I've spoken with people here today that, or this week that work at large organizations who, again, employ them in open source fields, right, and send them to conferences about open source, but they still have a lot of struggle in, you know, how do I convince leadership that this is the right thing to do or that we need to spend more time on this or that we need to devote engineering time to open source. And I think that's because uh, it's a new step change, and I also think it's because, bluntly, because of the, you know, what is the contribution to revenue, right? If you're an organization that's, that's focused on uh, you know, revenue as a, as a marker, which any for-profit organization is, then the direct question is gonna be asked is how do we see uh, money we spend on an engineer for op an open source project, how do we see that that contributes to our revenue directly? And that could be a complicated question to answer if, if it's even possible to answer. And then just in general, putting aside even open source, you know, incentivizing, in incentives in software are hard to begin with, right? Like we know this, like I, as I mentioned, I was an engineering manager for many years, so I, I'm well aware um, that there's a lot of perverse incentives that you can create in software if you're not careful. And so we have to understand those incentives and how we've set up our incentive structure uh, 
again, probably related to revenue, uh, and how that is gonna impact our ability to contribute to open source. And it's complicated for the open source projects because again, I think it's a very very preachy thing here, but you know, we've got maintainers burning both ends of the can. We saw uh, in the keynote uh, yesterday that like 30% of projects have one maintainer or less. Um, or one, I think it was one developer or less even, right? And you know, many don't even have a maintainer. Um, and so how we sustain projects uh, and how we continue to sustain projects is a, is a huge question. Again, something I've talked with a lot of uh, colleagues and friends about this week. Um, even for some of the largest open source projects in the world, uh, sustainability is a big question. And then I think lastly, software is more than just software. So what I mean by this is, you know, again, to, to steal from my, my colleague Melissa's keynote this morning, uh, you know, it's about the people, right? These people connections uh, are going to be the things that incentivize folks much more than maybe the financial incentives or, or any of these other things. And so understanding that and understanding how to relate that to the finance uh, side of things and to the, you know, the realities of the world we live in and the organizations we work for is, is critical for open source projects to understand as they're asking for help and, and setting themselves up to receive help. And then finally, it's complicated for individual contributors because you know, it, it can be tough. So first of all, I think you know, I, I, we have a whole set of uh, folks in our community team working on education uh, in software. And I think that you know, the education system, at least I'm, I'm mostly aware of the computer science education system in the US, uh, isn't necessarily, necessarily set up for folks to understand what it's like to collaborate with other people on a software project, right? Um, the inverse of this is, well, open source teaches you that really fast, right? Like you have to learn really quickly what it's like to collaborate, how to interact with people that you know, maybe aren't in the same time zone as you or maybe don't have the same first language as you, uh, and that's first language, human language or computer language. Um, and then again, we have these transactional versus social relationships. So if as an individual contributor, what I'm getting out of contributing to open source might not be um, you know, the financial gains that, that may come from that. And so, and if I turn it into a transactional relationship for me, it changes the way that my brain thinks about and incentivizes it to myself, right? Because then it becomes a very transactional one-to-one -one relationship, which isn't the thing that you know, makes open source thrive. And then, I mean, software incentives are hard. So again, like, I think it, it's hard for us as engineers and as software developers to understand you know, how to incentivize ourselves, right? What are we incentivized by? Um, and, and again, listen to the co maybe conflicting incentives of what you know, the company wants from me versus what I know is right for the long-term benefit, right? This, is, this goes outside of open source, right? This is when it comes to technical debt or anything. You know, how do we lay a foundation for the long-term viability of a project versus focus too short-term on you know, the revenue need? And so all of those complications, I think, mean that we really need to you know, make this business case for open source. And that's, that's the thing I want to focus on uh, towards the end of the talk here, which is you know, what uh, an organization, um, especially a for-profit organization wants, is for their, their folks to focus on that proprietary work, right? That's the inside the factory work that adds value to the raw materials that uh, have come in uh, and differentiates them from their competition, right? And we see that in the automotive industry today, right? There's all kinds of things that, uh, bells and whistles on cars that uh, are, are trying to differentiate self, themselves from their competition. Uh, but another very important thing uh, that I think, again, gets overlooked is the longevity of products and services, right? So yes, there's a lot of short-term revenue goals probably, right? If you're a public company, you're thinking about every quarter. Um, but setting up the company for the long-term uh, is also something that you know, proprietary work can do. And again, it drives the value to the customer. <clears throat> Versus non-proprietary work. So this is the work um, that's undifferentiated from competition. And I think sometimes, well, I know sometimes, that in organizations, open source gets lumped into this side of the things, right? Because, oh, well, it's the same as our competition, right? If we're using Kubernetes and they're using Kubernetes, well, it's the same. It's just the cost of doing business, right? A lot of folks will sign up for a foundation uh, and pay their, uh, their yearly fee to the foundation because, well, that's the cost of doing business. Um, and at best then, but the problem is if you look at open source that way, 
Um, you, wouldn't you wouldn't, I think, if you asked any of those business leaders, look at a supplier of a good for something you were manufacturing that way, but it's easy to look at open source that way because you're not paying anything for it. Um, and then at best, then maybe you'll get some efficiency from using open source software. Um, but at worst, it's gonna be this drain on staff that understand what you could be doing uh, if only you, you set them free. And, and so I think that seeing open source as the modern supply chain is the answer here because that's what allows businesses to understand the value. And there's actually a lot of research being done on this point. There's, I've, I've read a few studies out of Harvard Business School and a lot of them talk about more research they're doing, which I'm excited to see. Um, but in one, they said that they've already seen that they can correlate a 2x increase in productivity of engineers at companies that, who contribute back to open source directly versus those who don't. Uh, and so that's a huge corollary that I think, again, we probably notice and, and would expect, um, but it's great to see that we're actually studying this uh, and seeing that you know, in this new world, right, this world where we're kind of, um, you know, we, we went to the SaaS world <laughs> uh, and that took the operational burden maybe off of us from running most software. Well, now we're moving to the cloud native world where some of us are taking that operational burden back on because of the advantages we can get from open source and cloud native technologies. Uh, and that blurring of the line between on-prem and cloud then, uh, those changes are going to necessarily mean that open source is where we have to focus our, our attention. And so what I think you have to do in order to take advantage of this is move from consumers of open source to contributors. And I wanna very carefully define a bunch of terms here. So first, I think to, for, to move from being a consumer to a contributor, you have to move from a consumer to a customer. And I, I said earlier, like, no uh, business that's in manufacturing would think of, uh, you know, someone that was providing raw materials to them as just, you know, oh, we're just, we just consume that from them, right? They would at least see themselves as a customer, right? Because the risk, to, there's a real risk to the business if you don't understand uh, that supplier, you don't understand, you know, where the raw materials are coming from, you don't understand, you know, that it is part of the critical path of what you're producing. And so we have to think of open source the same way. Um, and that means, you know, looking for ways that we can partner better <clears throat> and at least, you know, make sure that we understand the sustainability of this, this raw material, this, this open source software we're consuming, right? And so that's probably contributing to financial needs, you know, kind of just the basics of making sure that open source is sustainable. Uh, but then I think, again, the, what, the strategic advantage is gonna come from moving from a customer to a contributor. And you know, that is where the real strategic advantage is gonna come. Being able to partner with open source programs to have influence uh, on their, uh, their roadmaps, to be able to attack and retrain, attract and retain talent, right? That's something everyone's worried about today. Uh, those are the things that are gonna come as you really start to move to a contributor of open source. And it goes beyond engineering, right? There's, there's, there's plenty of professional help that open source projects would love or need uh, that goes even beyond engineers, right? It's UX, it's documentation, it's design. Um, and that's what really is gonna set up the sustainability in the long term. And so again, I just, just to like kind of summarize uh, three things about being a customer and three things about being a contributor, I think one is acknowledging it's part of your supply chain, right? Understanding your supply chain, understanding the inventory of what's in it, right? We've, again, heard a lot about S-bombs and SPDX and lots of great ways to do that. I think those are great technical solutions, but I think step one is to acknowledge that it's a problem and we need to understand what our supply chain is. Um, and bringing contribu uh, contributions, right? Even just well-written issues and understanding uh, how to interact with uh, software that you're using, right? The, the log4j example of sending a cease and, not a cease and desist, but sending a lawyer letter, right, to fix a software that we never buy, like, couldn't show a bigger disconnect between, you know, how are we using this software and, and who's on the other end of it, um, and then contributing financially. And then to be a contributor, I think it's, it goes beyond that, right? It's this relationship. It's being able to, you know, come here, right? Again, we've done that, um, but also, you know, hire maintainers and, and hire contributors to work full time on projects, um, to contribute beyond engineering, right? I have lots of professionals uh, that work in our industry that go beyond engineering and those folks are needed in open source projects as well. Uh, and then focus on sustainability, right? What does the contributor to maintainer pipeline look like, right? These are things that open source projects are grappling with, um, but they're things that us as consumers, 
can be better contributors by, by helping. And so lastly, well, two last things, right? I promised you, okay, what can we do, right? Again, we, we believe all of this. So what can individual contributors do? Well, I think, again, we can focus on enumerating this, right? Showing the business what is the risk involved, right? If this, this piece of software goes away tomorrow, it's a critical part of our supply chain. Uh, and, and what impact would that be? Uh, that probably is a very large risk uh, and something that I think is a business risk that's not talked about a lot. Um, and no one, you know, no CIO or, or CEO out there wants to be the next one like to get a call about Apache Struts or whatever or be called in front of Congress to talk about it. And so I think if they understand this risk, uh, it will encourage them to, to get moving and, and understand that. But I also think you can encourage open source values, right? We see a lot in, in business uh, businesses wanting to, you know, do inner sourcing and have these kind of open source values within the business. Uh, I think the best way to do that is to have folks that understand open source and are active in those communities, right, that are aware of transparency and collaboration and all these things that come from uh, working in open source. And then lastly, let's say you're, a, you know, a business leader or a technology leader. Well, I think you have to see open source as this investment, both a risk mitigation and an investment in a strategic advantage. I think you have to understand, you've got to build a model for the impact to revenue, either of the risk or of the, of the competitive advantage, because if you don't build that model, I just I don't think it's gonna be sustainable. Uh, you have to focus on how much you're able to uh, uh, retain or attract new talent, right? Uh, and I think that we all know that open source is a big way to do that. You have to focus on the innovation that's coming, right? How fast you're able to innovate uh, using open source and being able to influence the open source software that you're using. Uh, as a supplier, how, how much does that speed up your, your innovation? And then lastly, tomorrow, you know, what can any of us do? Right, I think, again, you've heard time and time again this week these first two things, right? Oh, you need to itemize what open source you have. You need to identify the problems and, and, the, and the critical parts of your supply chain. Uh, but I think last, the thing that's missing from that, the thing that's a step bigger than, oh, geez, we need to secure all the software, is you know, how can we incentivize from today forward uh, those correct practices going forward, right? How can we be more involved in those communities uh, so that it's not you know, kind of a fire drill at the end to figure out, well, what do we have and how do we fix it? Uh, and so I think that is the number one thing uh, to take away from this talk is you know, how can we change the incentives or understand the incentives that are in place so far uh, in our organizations, in our engineering departments uh, to be better open source citizens. So. Thank you so much. I've got some more information and I'm gonna be collecting more stuff here at brendan.fyi slash open. And I've intentionally saved uh, time for questions, so I'd love to you know, hear where you wanna challenge what I've said or, or have questions about anything I talked about, but thank you so much. Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so the question is around uh, GitLab, and I'm repeat, I gotta, have to repeat it for the folks on, online. So the question is around GitLab and how, what have we done, you know, if we've got a customer that's paying us for GitLab and, you know, for support and those kinds of things, how do we uh, focus on getting that customer more involved? Well, that, I think that's a huge challenge as well, right? And so for us as a commercial open source company, it's, it's maybe also another unique challenge. Um, and so I think, the, I, I think the number one thing that we've done to help that uh, is our focus on transparency, right? We've always uh, been a transparent company and, and that has allowed us to really live open source values in a way um, that if we weren't focused on that, we wouldn't be able to, right? Our roadmap is out there, our issues are all public, uh, our, our code is out there, even our proprietary code, right? So we're an open core model uh, where we, ha we have the open source uh, software and then we build proprietary and software. That even that is source available. Uh, and so we've had customers even contribute to that, to the proprietary side uh, of the code. Um, and then, you know, also I think that co-creation of open source, we just have, kind of have that built in. Um, but it also takes educating customers that don't necessarily have that mentality of, you know, how can we co-create together um, and not, again, have a relationship that's different than just a, you know, supplier-consumer, but, you know, a supplier-partner. Uh, and so I think 
that it's, it's important to have programs focused on that, right? We have a technical account management program that's tied directly into that, tied directly into our product people. Uh, and it's a lot easier for them than someone that may be a less transparent company because it can all be in the open. Uh, and so again, that, that adds to their ability to impact um, product. Right, yeah, so the question is, are the TAMs incentivized to get customers involved? Uh, actually, not directly, <laughs> um, but the TAMs are incentivized for growth, right? And we know that growth in our customers comes from uh, expanded use of the different areas of, of GitLab. So GitLab is a DevOps platform. You know, it's got Git, of course, and it's got CI, CD, and it's got observability, and it's got issue planning. And we know that the thing that drives most growth for us is folks using more of that platform. Uh, and that necessitates, I think, for the TAMs, for the technical account managers, uh, having conversations with a, with a wider group of people than they would otherwise maybe have to at, at an organization, um, which then, I think, gets the attention of the right folks to make the, wait, hold on, we can have a different level of relationship here than just, oh, I'm a, I'm a director that bought some software and that's it. Great question. Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> great, yeah, that's a great question. And so, yeah, so just to, again, repeat the question. Um, it's from the lawyer in the room. Which is important for the question because, you know, we've talked about open source as critical infrastructure, and in the law, words have meaning, and critical infrastructure has meaning. Uh, and so because of that, if it is critical infrastructure, truly, then that means that the government can regulate it or should regulate it or does regulate it. Um, and so what role does the government have to play in all this? Um, I would definitely encourage you, if you didn't see the keynote from... Um, from Eric, yeah, I, I, I think I subscribe to Eric's philosophy. I think I knew that before I saw that talk, and now I do even more. <laughs> and so what that philosophy is, is I think, I think government has a role in incentivizing the right practices here. And I think, I think um, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that that's true because software is everywhere, right? So even if you want to argue the finer points of is open source software critical infrastructure by the definition of critical infrastructure, even if that answer is no, open source software is used in critical infrastructure, right? You cannot argue against that, um, in, my, in my opinion, I guess. But <laughs> because this, we saw that with the Colonial Pipeline hack and, 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 and various things like that, um, the, the electrical grid, right? Things that are critical infrastructure are running software. Open source software is eating the world. Uh, so I think there is a role for the government to play. Uh, I would hope, um, and now this is probably you know, getting a little political from my own political philosophy, I would hope that incentivizing would be the best way for the, for the government to be involved, but that's definitely, comma, Brendan O'Leary personal opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a huge, I think there's, um, I love what uh, the OpenSSF uh, open is doing in experimenting how can you know, we turn money into security. Again, we, we heard about that. Uh, I'm excited that we're doing that, and hopefully, I would hope from that, uh, there can be some successful experiments that then the government can use to say, okay, we can incentivize these kinds of things to happen, and we will get this result. Um, that would be government at its best. Whether or not we'll see that, you know, that remains to be seen. <laughs> Great question. Okay. What advice would you give to leadership that would be worried about potential litigation on contributed source code? It's a great question. And so the question, yeah, I don't need to repeat it because you said it in the mic, but yeah, the, uh, so I, I think that there is a lot of um, settled law on that. I think, I think it's, it's very clear um, as long as you have, you know, I think if you look at the OCI uh, and approved licenses, if you look at things like DCA, um, and the other one, the other contributor agreement. I think they're pretty settled law that um, uh, 
that as long as you, you follow kind of the, what they say, um, I don't think there's a huge liability there. Now, if you don't know the licenses and the open source software that you're using, the, the inverse is true. You have a massive liability and you don't realize it. Um, and so you do, again, need to do that, that identify an itemized step of understanding uh, you know, what you have in place because you, you also cannot just assume something's open source and that you can use it, right? If there's a copyleft license, yeah, there's a huge liability probably involved. Uh, and so you have to understand uh, what exactly is in the software you're using first. Great, great, yeah, go ahead. Oh, we had one here, sorry, thanks. Uh, what's happening in China with Giddy and hap what's happening with GitLab? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, I've, in my research, I know that GitLab's been very popular in China, mm -hmm. not necessarily as GitLab itself, but as a licensed product in a, in a special venture. Sure, sure. And, and as people might not know, uh, people have been uh, saying that GitHub has been temporarily been banned again mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. China, and you can have to only do development in private repos. So what's happening, and how's GitLab uh, navigating things, and uh, how do you yeah. see things going forward? Sure. I'll start by saying I'm definitely not the, the best person to talk about that from, from GitLab, and I could get you in touch with those folks if, you, if you're super interested in it. Um, but yes, as you mentioned, uh, GitLab in China currently is uh, being deployed in China through a joint venture that we have there called Jihu. Um, and, and so that allows them to have a fully in-country, um, and they actually have their own distribution of GitLab. It's, again, the beauty of open source is GitLab's open source and open for everyone, and, and so they're able to create their own distribution and have it there. Uh, I think it's very complicated for web scale companies to understand how to negotiate this, and I have zero advice on how to do that. <laughs> um, and, and so I think you're right that it's something that we're gonna continue to see, but I, again, Brennan O'Leary opinion, hopeful optimist, is I would hope that open source can be a big part of that solution. Yes. Thanks, uh, great presentation, I love the slides. Thank you. Um, you know, probably something that you see with GitLab is many companies, pro they have proprietary software, but then go and, and have public repos to kind of create an ecosystem of open source around their proprietary software, which mm -hmm. I think is a good idea. Many companies are doing it, uh, and they bring their customers and say, hey, you can, you know, this is this, this open source integration, take this, take that. Uh, but from that point to what you were talking about, like make those companies contribute to open source, contribute to some of those critical mm -hmm. software supply chain components, I see that that's a big l leap there. Like they, they, it's a significant change between just, just open sourcing your scripts, some, some things like that around your uh, proprietary software than really contributing. Uh, I would love to hear your, your take on that. Uh, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, I, and I know I'm caveating every answer in Brendan O'Leary opinion, but this is another one that <laughs> could be hot, right? Uh, so I will. Um, yeah, I, I think that if you're a company, if your company thinks, oh, we're gonna open source something, again, that's great, right? Fantastic, but more open software, better. Um, and hopefully get a lot of eyes on it and make bugs shallow. Um, but that does not mean you're open for open source, right? One of my, my first uh, things. Um, that means you're trying to, you might be unfortunately moving more towards consumer and more towards take than give, right? Um, and, and, I, and that's unfortunate for open source, but I think it's also unfortunate for the company if that's where they stop, right? I think that's a great start because it gets you into that mentality of the value of open source. Um, but I, again, I'm hoping with this presentation and, and to continue talking about it um, to say the real value comes when you're able to partner with open source and all of the open source projects you're working on or working with or using, uh, not just open sourcing some code and saying, well, now we have open.organization.com and we're great, right? Um, and so I, I think that it's important for organizations not to see that as a finish line, but maybe as a starting line, it could, could be great. 
All right, I've got one minute left. If anyone has one more burning question, great. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.